How's it going everyone? Vlad here with solosplc.com and welcome to the next lecture on PLC programming using factory IO. As always, we're going to take a practical scenario that you will see in industrial automation in manufacturing and we're going to be programming our Allen Bradley PLC that is currently sitting above my head, which is a compact Logix series PLC. We will be programming in Studio 5000 version 32. That being said, the principles that we are covering here are going to be applicable across an array of different platforms, different PLCs. And so if you want to adapt this to your specific application, feel free to do so. As always, you can find the code that we've been creating on the GitHub page, and you can also find the factory IO scene exactly as it has been built and tested by me. So you can very easily integrate that and do the tests yourself. I want to ask you once again, if you can subscribe to the channel, if you want to see something different, if you're looking to see more of the same content, make sure to leave me a comment down below. Tell me exactly what that is. If you have any problems, if you have any scenarios of your own in the manufacturing space, if you have many, maybe interesting challenges that we can cover on this channel, make sure to leave that in the comments as well. We also have a forum on solacepc.com where you can leave your more technical questions, be able to attach an image and add some more details. So feel free to check that out. But without any further delay, let's get started. So in the example today, I want to create a scenario that you often see when it comes to different packaging machinery in which I've worked quite a bit of times. So here, what we have is an array of boxes coming, imagine from a case packer going into a palletizer. And what you will notice is that these boxes are currently backing up due to this roller before going into the next station which once again is going to be the hypothetical palletizer. So the challenge in the scenario is to create a easier way. So first of all, we're going to be managing boxes at the infeed. The palletizer is also only able to process the boxes at a slower speed than the case packer is able to produce them. So we need to release one box at a time into this hypothetical palletizer. And we need to be able to detect that with the sensors that we're going to integrate on our production line. We also want to address a different challenge. So if you've been in a real world scenario, you will know that if you're going to be placing a lot of boxes back to back with each other, well, the laws of physics are going to start crushing the boxes. So in a normal manufacturing scenario, this first box is going to experience a lot of pressure from the boxes behind it, and it's going to start crushing against this roller, thus damaging the product. So we also want to use a sensor right here to limit the number of boxes coming out from the machine before this system. So before we begin programming our PLC, let's observe a few very obvious failures that can occur. So in factory IO, if I select an element, you've already noticed me doing this a couple of times, I'm able to actuate the element by pressing this um, essentially force button. So here, if I retract the roller, you'll notice that the boxes are going to start going through. That being said, if I re-enable the roller, you'll notice that there's an obvious uh, limit to how that's going to be actuated. So the first challenge that we need to solve is being able to release a single case at a time. And some of you have already encountered this challenge. The easy solution to this would be to accelerate the conveyor belt that is after the roller in order to pull this box forward. And then when there is an opening, we're going to release this roller back in place. That being said, that challenge is not as obvious as it seems. We also need a photo eye to be able to detect the next box or to be able to detect when this box is completely through in order to raise the roller. So I believe that the easier approach is going to be to raise this roller once the box has finished passing through. So I'm going to once again use my factory IO panel. I'm going to drag out a sensor. I've shown this a number of times. It needs to be at the level of the conveyor so I can hold down the V key on my keyboard. I can raise it one cell and then I can use Y in order to rotate it. So once I lower the roller, my box needs to be completely through before I raise this roller. The other thing that, as I had mentioned, this palletizer is only able to accept one box at a time. So once the box is on the second conveyor, 
it needs to go all the way through to the sensor before the next box is able to release. And once again, that's just the scenario that I've invented. You can certainly increment and decrement your requirements as they need to be created. But in this specific case, my case packer is going to produce a lot more boxes than my palletizer is able to absorb, thus creating a on an automation challenge that we're going to be working on today. The second sensor that I have on my conveyor belt, as I've mentioned, as you start to pile up a lot of boxes, I want to limit the amount of boxes produced by my case packer. And this is very commonly called an interlock between your systems. So when you have two systems that feed from one to the other, you have an interlock from the palletizer in this case, that's going to tell the case packer, hey, you're making way too many cases you need to stop because otherwise the product is going to be damaged. So inside of my PLC, I'm going to use the signal from this second sensor. And once a certain amount of time had elapsed of that box being or blocking that sensor, I need to tell my case packer, which in this case is going to be the emitter, stop producing any cases. The last item I want to take care of are going to be the push buttons. So once again, I have a new set of push buttons here on the panel that allow me to stop and start the system. And so I need to tie all of this back to my PLC in order to make a cohesive project for the viewers and therefore ultimately be able to start the systems and to stop the system. So this all needs to orchestrate all the conveyors need to start and stop from the push button, but ultimately tie that into my PLC and then send this information back into factory IO to make the system function. And so as I start adding elements into my driver, I need to be really careful about adding the right elements into the right IO. And you will experience this when you're working with wiring. If you're adding new systems, if you're troubleshooting existing systems, you need to be very careful into which your input and output points your physical devices go. So here I'm going to be really careful by adding from the left hand side all the way to the right. So first I have two push buttons. So I have the start button one and I have the stop button one. If I go into the driver, I've already showcased this to you, but these are going to be inputs. So start button one and start button uh, and stop button one. Now, very important point. So remember that the push buttons have a light, which is going to be the output, but we are looking for the input. So start button one is going to be my input right here. And stop button one is going to be my input right here. The other thing I want to mention, so remember that tags don't exist. I had not created all the tags. I'm going to go through that process. I'm not going to show that on screen to save a little bit of time, but you can ultimately position your tags in any way you would like, as long as there is a free space. So one of the first problems I've encountered while experimenting a little bit with the conveyor speeds, first of all, I want to show you how to enable this. So if I stop my animation, I can select the conveyor. I can right click, I can go into configuration and I can set this to analog. And so what analog means is that the signal that we are going to get from the PLC is going to set the speed of the conveyor. So if I play my scene, once again, I can select the conveyor and here you'll notice that I have a little slider so I can vary that all the way to 10 and I can bring that down all the way to zero and then in reverse for this specific conveyor. Now the problem begins if we leave both conveyors at the same speed, I've mentioned this a little bit earlier, then we are not able to separate the boxes in order to send one at a time into the palletizer. And so again, just to demonstrate, if I select my roller stop, I can unforce it. And then as soon as I try to force it back when the sensor is cleared, it's going to either allow two boxes, it's going to get a box stuck. It's not an ideal scenario. And once again, this is a common problem that you will see in your uh, manufacturing conveyors. So the way we can uh, approach this problem or one of the ways that we can approach this problem is we can select the other conveyor and we can slow this down. Now, the obvious constraint here is that this conveyor cannot run slower than the boxes. So the boxes should still be able to pile in uh, faster from the case packer side, but it should not be possible for them to get stuck at the beginning of this conveyor. So if I run it too slow, there's an obvious problem. And so now if we test the roller stop, I can simply enable it, 
you'll see that we're still not quite there. So I can reduce this a little bit further. I believe that I had it at like 0 0.9 and I can increase this ever so slightly. So 3.4, if I release the stop, we are barely able to make this box. And so the idea here, again, we can play with the speeds. This could be on the VFD side. As you can see, that definitely didn't work this time. I can increase this a little bit further and see if that works. So roller is going to be dropped. And so there we go. So we're able to catch the boxes and release them one, of a, one at a time into the next machine. Again, my reaction time is going to be a little bit slower than the PLC. Let's get into the PLC code. I'm going to show you all the systems that I'm bringing into the driver and then we can start programming. All right, so I've pulled in all of the tags that we need inside of the factory IO driver. So those are going to be the push buttons, the diffuse sensors, the conveyor belt, and the stop that we're going to be raising the roller of. And I've put them all in factory or studio 5000. And so make sure that you label all of these accordingly. You will notice that I've labeled all of them system two and then a very descriptive name. So I've mentioned this a lot of times. Again, this could be part of your tag. In this case, I cannot unfortunately change the actual tag because that's the limitation of factory IO, but I can certainly change the description. I can also alias tags if that's something you do at your facility or for practice purposes more than uh, welcome to do so. That being said, let's get to programming. So inside of the previous routine, we already had a number of rungs. We can certainly create a new routine. I would like to stick to the same one, at least for now. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a rung and I'm going to add a description. So I believe I've done so in the past. I typically in programs, if I want to separate some very specific applications, so this is going to be system two. So I've done this in a production environment. You can add even more symbols. You can also describe what your system does. So the comments are there for that specific purpose. So I'm going to say um, the infeed slash discharge conveyor system between case packer and palletizer because that is our scenario. I'm going to click away and I can start programming my system. So remember the first state is going to be the push buttons. So the push buttons are going to enable the entire conveying system and then the logic is going to apply. So we've already created this logic in the past. So I can simply add a couple of tags just as we've done again at the very top. It's going to be the exact same uh, rung. We can obviously copy paste that as well. I'm going to just zoom in a little bit so you can see better and I can see my screen better as well. So remember, if we ever forget the tags, it's very easy to navigate back, but we can also take a random tag here and based on the descriptions, we can simply iterate through that index. So instead of four, I remember it was six and that is the start push button. The stop push button was a seven, if I am not mistaken, but my descriptions should not lie. So I'm going to remove this. And this is going to be a custom tag, which is going to tell me that the system is enabled. So I'm going to label this tag with S2. And here I'm going to say system running. And I'm going to create this as a Boolean. So new system running boolean underneath tutorials. That's fine because I'm not going to read this tag so it can be program scoped. That is perfectly fine by me. I'm going to copy this OTE, paste that right there and ch change that to an XIC. I see. Perfect. So if the system is running, the stop button is not pressed, we should be in a good condition. So when my system is running, all the conveyors should be running. So I never had to essentially change the uh, run or stop of the conveyors, but we need to send, remember, the right values to the conveyors. So what I'm going to create here is a rung that will either send a means to enable the conveyors or disable them or set the speed to zero for the analog conveyors. Again, in a real world, world scenario, you could permanently set the speed on let's say a variable frequency drive, or you can set them and then allow the contactors to simply enable or disable the motor. But in this case, we need to do a little bit more than that. So I'm going to create a 
Well, actually, first of all, if the system is running, I need to enable the digital conveyor. So that was, uh, this is my input. So I need to enable the output. Let's see here, six. So that's the case backer. So maybe seven. There you go. So conveyor one is going to be enabled. Of course, we need to change that to an OTE instruction, but that's not all. If we are running, then we need to set the speeds of our other two conveyors. And we can do that using a move instruction. So here I'm just going to drag out an XIC, change that to a move. Again, whether you branch that out or you simply put it in line, it makes absolutely no difference in this specific case. And I'm going to set them to the speeds that we've discussed earlier. So if I'm not mistaken, 0.8 was for the first one. And that was Solus PLC F out and if i'm not mistaken that was zero i'm going to go view that tag actually let's just navigate into my program scope tags f zero so it looks like i mislabeled this so this is going to be the output instead of this so i'm going to remove this description and then the second tag is going to be the f output one and that's going to be my second conveyor and so again, we can change the speeds afterwards. We're going to simply write this in and then see what, um, what that looks like in just a moment. So let's go back to our program, which is factory IO sim. And here I'm going to write it like that. That's perfectly fine. And then the second conveyor, if I'm not mistaken, we had written a 3.0. We can fine tune that once we test it out. So that's going to be right there. And if the system is not running, so remember that this is going to be disabled, but the move needs to be re-executed again. So I'm going to branch around this. I'm going to put this here and I'm going to paste. First of all, I'm going to put this as an XIO. So if the system is not running, then I need to set both of these conveyors to zero. And that should be all we need to do in order to test out the start and stop features of the conveyor. So I'm going to save this logic, press on yes, and then I'm going to start the simulation in factory IO. I'm going to unforce or remove all the forces that I've done on the system and start my testing. So just as we would expect, as soon as I press the start push button, my conveyors are going to start rolling. Again, at the speeds we have set in our program, we can see them in the top left-hand corner of factory IO. Once I press the stop push button, everything stops. And as we would expect, none of the boxes are going to be moving. The next thing we need to do is we need to enable the case backer based on certain conditions. We need to stop the cases at the sensor and we need to be able to release that into our palletizer. So when does the case backer produce boxes? Well, when the sensor that's going to be with the backup sensor is not blocked. And really that is the only condition under which the case backer should not be producing boxes. So how can we tackle this problem? Well, first of all, going back to the controller tags, I just want to double check the input, which I often do as I'm programming these systems. And that's going to be the palletizer infeed sensor. That is not correct. It's going to be the case backer backup sensor. So this is input nine. I'm going to copy this in and we're going to be doing this based on a timer. So if the sensor is blocked for a certain amount of time, we're going to stop the case packer from producing. And of course, the case packer producing is going to be the uh, emitter that we've created, which is going to be this signal right here, which is B out six. And so going back into our logic, we can create the appropriate scenario. So here I'm going to create a new rung and I'm going to create, first of all, the XIC and XIO and OTE, just so I can see what's going on. So this is the case backup sensor and the output we said was going to be uh, number six. I keep re referencing back to this because it's an easy way to, uh, to remember what's going on inside of my program. So I'm going to be putting that right there. So if the sensor is blocked, then I want this to be disabled. And of course that's going to be an XIO, but this is simply not enough because if this is the case, as soon as the boxes are going to be in front of the sensor, we're going to disable 
the case backer. So we need to create a timed condition. So here, when the sensor is blocked, I need to be able to count a certain time. So actually, this is going to be XIC. So when the sensor is backed up, we're going to start a timer. Once again, I'm going to drag out any instruction and I'm going to select AT on. And this is going to be my case backer back up timer. I'm going to create this new timer. I'm going to put that inside of my program. And the preset, again, this needs to be tested. So in a real world scenario, I, I would test this out. So if it's backed up for more than three seconds, I'm going to set this to zero. That's when I need to, to stop my machine. And so if it is backed up and the timer is down counting, I'm going to create a branch like so. And let's see here, this is going to be an XIC with the timer done counting. I'm going to add this right here and I need to remove this at the very end. So what happens in this logic? So when my sensor is backed up, it's going to start with this timer. If it's still backed up and the timer is done counting after three seconds. So remember that in this case, it's 3000 milliseconds. So after three seconds, I'm going to disable uh, my case backer. And actually this is going to be the opposite. So I need to be when the timer is done counting, then it needs to disable. And so how can we flip this bit? So when the timer is down counting, I need to disable the current logic would enable it. So I'm going to create another branch around the entire system. And it's instead of placing this here, I'm going to place this on the, uh, on the branch here below. And here I'm going to create another condition. So this is going to be OTE and this is going to be case packer. I'm going to actually label that as S2 underscore case packer backed up. And so this is going to be a new Boolean that's going to reside inside of my tutorials perfectly fine. And if it is backed up, so if it is not backed up, I want to enable the condition. Once it is backed up, I'm going to disable the case backer. So this logic should be perfectly fine. Let's test it out. Let's make sure we download it to the PLC and test it out on our conveying system. So if I start the system, what we will notice inside of our program is that the timer is going to count up to about one second and a half. And obviously the case backer is not going to back up. If I go back into factory IO, and if I raise or if I force my stop, which is going to be the next component at the palletizer level, then we can observe the case backer back up. So you'll notice that the boxes are going to start piling up. And once enough boxes have been backed up, we will notice that the emitter has been turned off. So in reality, this is going to be the maximum amount of boxes that we will have backed up inside of our system instead of having boxes all the way back to the emitter. And again, remember that this is a scenario that we've created in a real world application. You can have conveyor belts spanning hundreds of meters or if not going between different plants. So you want to have this logic enabled across the way. And I think that a timer is the easiest way to do this in this scenario, because if the system starts up, if there's way to deblock the system, the boxes will start circulating. You'll see that opening and you will re-enable the upstream systems. The last challenge that we need to tackle here is the request of a box, the lowering of our stop sign, and then feeding one case at a time into the palletizer. So if we navigate back into our logic, first of all, how do we request a box? Well, in my mind, if there has been no box in front of that last sensor for at least 10 seconds, we can reasonably request a box. So let's set up that logic as such. Again, there's going to be several ways that we can get this done. So if the sensor, which is going to be the last one, has not seen a box for a certain period of time, we can request a box. So this is going to be, let's see, so this is 9, 10, palletizer in feed stop sensor. I believe that there's a different sensor that we had there as well. So I just want to double check. Uh, so this is going to be this sensor. So the fuse sensor number three, if I go back into here, the fuse sensor number three is going to be input eight. So let's make sure we use that 
appropriately. So if the sensor has not seen anything, so XIO, this is going to start a timer to on, and this is going to be palletizer empty timer. Once again, I can set this to a very large value. So new palletizer timer inside of tutorials. And let's actually make that 10 seconds so we don't have to wait too long. And if this timer is completed, and if this is still off, so I'm going to create an XIC, it's going to be done. So if this timer is completed, I'm going to use a latch. So this is palletizer needs case. So palletizer needs a case, which is going to trigger the scenario that we need to infeed a single box inside of the palletizer. So I'm going to create this as a Boolean. So new palletizer needs case inside of our tutorials. So we know that if the palletizer has not received a case in 10 seconds, it means that it needs another case. What's the other scenario? Well, it's if it has seen a case and it's seen the falling edge of that sensor. And that's going to be another condition that we can also bundle in here. So I'm going to add this underneath this rung and we're going to look at an instruction which is called one shot falling. And that's going to accomplish exactly that. So this instruction is going to set our bit once, which is going to be the palletizer needs case. Uh, once the transition of that sensor is going to be set from true to false, which is the falling edge of that case. So I'm going to put that in and this is going to be the infeed sensor. So this is going to be the condition that we need. So I can create a dummy storage bit as well as output bits so S2 storage. And this is going to be S2 output just to make this instruction work. So I'm going to create both of these as booleans. So that's perfectly fine, both on the storage and the output side. And so this is going to be XIC actually. So this is going to transition to high and then it's going to be low. And what I need this to do is once it's done the transition, so the output is going to be set to high for a single scan. I'm going to enable this palletizer needs case as well. So in this case, all we're doing is setting up that the palletizer is requesting a single case. So next we need to handle the stop and I'm going to create a new rung exactly for that. And that's going to be my output eight, if I am not mistaken. So I'm going to add a new rung, copy this input in and change that to out, so out eight. Uh, roller up. That is exactly correct. So that's going to be an OTE. So this is going to be enabled whenever the palletizer uh, does not need a case, but if it needs a case, it should be disabled. So this is going to be XIO. So if the palletizer needs a case, we need the roller to go down. So if the palletizer in this case, it currently needs a case, this is going to go down. When is it going to go up? It's going to go up whenever it is seeing a transition or it's seeing a box go through and it's going to see the end of that case. So how do we detect that? Well, we need to effectively do the exact same thing that we've done here. So this is going to be not the infeed sensor, but it's going to be the other sensor that we have set up in front of the roller. And I can put that right here. And I believe that is going to be number 10. So sensor in feed stop sensor that is correct. And that's going to be one shot falling. And once again, one shot falling is going to create a new tag. So storage one, I'll put one. We need to create both of these tags. So new storage one, both of these are going to be Booleans. And once this has fell, we need to restore the roller up. So I'm going to create a condition in which this sets the output. So I'm going to branch around my palletizer needs case and my S2 output. So this is going to be S2 output one is going to re-raise the roller back up. And so the cycle should continue to repeat, but we need to disable this bit. And by disabling this bit is when the palletizer needs the case again. So I'm going to simply copy this output one 
and it should go whenever we latch this needs case. And so once we've compiled the code, you can see it already clicking since I was testing a couple of things, but you'll notice that we're getting the exact result that we would expect. So we're releasing a single case. Once that case is past the last sensor, it's going to release a new case. Once again, this is positioned very tightly. I think in a real world scenario, we could play with the speeds a little bit better, but you can clearly see that the cases are being released into the palletizer as we would expect. Once we deplete the number of cases, we also notice that cases are being produced by the case packer, just as we had specified by the sensor that is detecting the infeed side of the, or the discharge side of the case packer or the infeed side of the palletizer. Again, we can play with the timers. We can do whatever we need in the logic, but we can clearly see that the application has been written successfully. Once the cases deplete, we can see the case packer in the back there re-enable, produce a couple of more cases. Once they get up to the stack, they're going to stop producing again with our logic. And we have thus completed the required application for our manufacturing setting. Hopefully you guys have learned something. Again, if you have any questions, if you've uh, got any trouble implementing this, if you want to download this, uh, make sure to leave a comment down below. Make sure to subscribe to the channel and let me know what you think.